forces so that there are lots of paths between them going this way and lots of paths between them going that way. And then they say, okay, now I stick these two vertices together, I find the solution. Maybe, right, so if the solution went through this vertex, uh, when I, when I uh, uh, you know, uncontract it, I need, to, I need to be able to find paths you know, like this or like that, depending on, uh, depending on you know, what's happening in the rest of my solution. Uh, okay, so I do have lots of paths like that. Now the only problem is I need to make sure that when I uncontract and I substitute the, uh, you know, the original path, that I don't interfere too much with the rest of the solution. So to do that, what they, what they actually do here, they, uh, this outcome tells you that there are many short paths between U and V. Length at most two, going this way and going that way. Length at most three, at most three inches. So then, you know, if, if all your paths are short, they can only interfere with the solution a little bit. So you contract, you solve for much bigger k. But then when you are contraction or it's not contraction, it's an identification. I'm sorry, it's not an identification. It's an identification. I wasn't sure how to say unidentified. So, um, right. so it's not a contraction, thank you. Right, but because the paths are short, uh, you're okay. Okay, so so maybe this happens and this we more or less understand. Or maybe, if, and the theorem is that if you cannot find these two vertices, if you cannot find two vertices with lots of short paths this way and lots of short paths that way, then the graph in some sense degenerate. So now let me tell you what that means. Uh, so uh, they say the graph have bounded cut width. What's cut width? Um, so I want to order the vertices of my treatment, and I want to count how many edges, so I ordered the vertices, now I can look at different cuts, right? I can look at you know, different gaps in the order. And I want to know how many edges go this way across this gap. So that's uh, that's cut width. If for every if for every gap, the number of edges going this way across this gap is at most c, then I say my tournament has cut width at most c. Right? So I choose the best order, then I look at the worst gap. If for every gap, if I can promise that uh, this number is at most c, I say the, the cut width is at most c. So what they prove is that either you can find h two versus u and v, or your tournament has small cuts, uh, small cut width, where right, uh, so it's small in terms of uh, in terms of the scale. K is part of the input, so that's that's all fine. And then uh, they can do dynamic programming. So I don't want to go too much into the details of that, but um, but the idea is so I have this uh, have this uh, ordering that gives me you know that uh, uh, witnesses that the cut width is small. And now I, I try and see you know, what pairs of words I can connect. But the thing is, because not too many, not, not too many edges go this way, paths cannot wiggle too much across any gap, right? Uh, so I have at most CK edges going this way, so I cannot have you know, CK plus one paths doubling back. And that allows you to do the, the dynamic programming. That, uh, that tells you that you know, in every update step, you can do it in polynomial time, because nothing too complicated happens. The complex, the, the level at which uh, uh, the solution gets more and more complicated, every step is bounded because of this uh, C. All right, so, so that's, uh, that's, that's our algorithm. Uh, and then, okay, so that's it, the Ashes string case. But now, what, what's the Berkeley's string case? So that's uh, uh, the uh, main result in my talk that we can, with Alex Scott and Paul Seymour, we can do it, uh, we can also solve the, uh, the uh, vertices joint problem in polynomial time. And the polynomial is uh, pretty big. It's something like n to the 27k cubed. <laughs> um, so, but, but the algorithm is sort of nothing like the edge, the edge algorithm. There's a dynamic programming step there, but that's, that's about uh, right we work. We tried pretty hard to kind of find something to identify, but, but we failed. So, so for the other one, for edge joint, mm -hmm. it must pass on the polynomial. Uh, the um, it is faster. I'm not sure how much faster, but it's definitely faster. Um, right. So from now on, what I'm going to do is talk about the, a little bit about the proof of this theorem. So we actually just finished writing the paper, so I think I think it's actually true. It was a bit scary. It's kind of you know a complicated algorithm with lots of little details, and you know we were giving talks about it, and so like, oh, I'm quite it down there. But hopefully, it's true now. Okay. So. Uh, but in any case, the, the level of details I'm going to show you, you wouldn't be able to tell. There's a mistake. Uh, safe thing. Okay, so here we go. Uh, all right, so there are two, there are kind of two, two parts to the, uh, to the algorithm. There's a 
sub problem that we solve, a kind of a more, more uh, special problem that we solve, where we deal with something called um, critical graphs, and I'll explain what that is, and then we reduce the general problem to a bunch of uh, problems on critical graphs. So first, so I'll talk a little bit about the critical graph part and, and a little bit more about the non-critical graphs. Okay, so what's a critical graph? Uh, so it's actually a graph and a bunch of pairs of terminals. I say it's critical because there is a linkage, so if I can find uh, K vertex to joint paths connecting SI to TI. But also I want to insist that if I delete any vertex from, from my graph, there is no link. Right? So every vertex is necessary. Uh, right? it's, it is not only the case that some linkage results both vertices, it is in fact the case that uh, if I delete any vertex, that destroys all my linkages. Okay, and then the first step is to get a bottom on time algorithm to find the linkage in a critical graph. So the idea is if I give you a graph and I promise you it's critical, you need to give me the linkage back. In fact, uh, it's a little bit, uh, the algorithm is a little bit more general than that. Because what it does is I give you a graph and a bunch of terminals, and uh, either it gives me a linkage back, or it says, no, no, your graph wasn't critical. Right? So sometimes it might work for not critical graphs, but uh, it's promised to always work for criti critical graphs. Now, one sort of uh, technical point. So the point here is to actually output the linkage. Right? Uh, it, is not to, it is not enough to just say, there is a linkage, because, uh, because I'm going to use it on critical graphs where I know there is a linkage. So, so I'm going to describe this algorithm a little bit. Okay. Uh, so let's see. So this is a little similar to that um, to that cut with, uh, business I was talking about, except we couldn't uh, couldn't say it quite so nicely. Um, so the idea is for I have my crystal graph. Uh, I want to I want to find a special ordering. Of, uh, uh, of the vertices in it. So I hope everybody knows where the is. So, uh, so first of all, I claim there is an ordering so that every path traverses its ordering monotonically. There is never kind of a back edge in a, in a path in my linkage with respect to the ordering. Why? Well, that's not very hard. So here are my classes. This is one T1 and the class between them. S2, T2 and the class between them, and so on. SK, TK, the class between them. And you know, I'm in a critical graph, so that exists. So now I'll just uh, start sweeping horizontally. Take, you know, S1, S2, SK. And then take the second vertex of this path. And then take the third vertex of this path. So this is an ordering where you know, every pass uh, uh, moves uh, right over. Every class only uses forward edges with respect to the circle. Okay, but now the point is that we can actually find an ordering where, so we cannot find this ordering, this is too hard. But we can find an ordering where every pass uses not too many backward edges. Right? There is an ordering where every pass uses no backward edges. We can algorithmically find an ordering where every pass uses at most C of K backward edges. And the reason for that is that if you look in a critical graph and you analyze uh, and you analyze the or, you know, you analyze what the paths look like. You get some control over over the over the backward edges in the, in the graph in general, right? So if, if you look at the ordering that I told you about the s's and the, the, the s's and then the second vertices and the third vertices, well, all the paths go horizontally, uh, go I'm sorry, go horizontally. But in fact, edges like these are also under control. There aren't too many of them. So I don't want to go into into too much detail about that. But the point is, there aren't very many backward edges. And that's why this step works. I can algorithmically find an ordering where not too many edges go there. But now we're in a situation similar to, to bounded couplets. I can do, but now I have an ordering of the vertices of the graph, and I'm guaranteed that there is a linkage where across every gap only a few edges go backward, a few edges of the linkage. So now I can do dynamic programming again because nothing too complicated can happen to the linkage. Across each across each gap, so that's sort of the general idea. All right, so this this uh, step you should maybe not be convinced, but at least uh, be content with the fact that we have uh, we have uh, an algorithm for critical graphs. Yeah. Please. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how to use it, and that's just it. Okay, so idea the idea is the following. 
So first of all, uh, 